In the last few months, the EU has been trying to come up with a more concrete China policy. Unsurprisingly, this has sparked a furious internal debate within the EU, with divisions not just between Western and Central Europe, but also within Western Europe, and even within individual Western European governments. Hint, we're looking at you, Germany. So in this video, we're going to have a look at what's happened recently, the divisions within the EU on how to approach Beijing, and try to figure out who's right. In other words, what sort of relationship the EU should have with China. Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. The EU has always had a confusing China policy. On the one hand, China is one of the EU's main trading partners, and vice versa. On the other hand, most of Europe recognises the threat that China poses to what commentators sometimes describe as the liberal world order. And European countries are, to varying degrees, loyal to the US, thanks to its role as Europe's main security partner. This is why the language the EU uses to describe its relationship is so ambiguous. In 2019, for example, the EU described China as a partner, competitor and systemic rival, all at the same time. However, with US-China tensions escalating and China playing an ever greater role in European political discourse, in the last few months the EU has tried to come up with a more coherent China policy. This really began with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen's speech in late March, where she argued for de-risking but not decoupling. In practice, this involves reducing Europe's dependence on China in certain strategically significant areas, like batteries and semiconductors, while maintaining diplomatic connections with Beijing. This policy is supposed to be more hawkish than the EU's current policy, which basically involves unconditional trade with China, but more dovish than the US's current policy, which involves basically cutting off all trade with China, i.e. decoupling and shunning diplomacy. A week later, von der Leyen and French President Macron paid a visit to Beijing, where Macron seemed to half endorse von der Leyen's new de-risking policy, but also made some controversial comments that implied that Europe shouldn't get involved in Taiwan, which sparked some controversy both in the US and in Central Europe. So you have a problem. You got this crazy world is blown up and the United States has absolutely no say and Macron, who's a friend of mine, is over with China kissing his ass, okay, in China. I said France is now... The Polish Prime Minister pushed back against Macron's calls for European strategic autonomy, insisting that the alliance with the United States is the absolute foundation of our security, while the Lithuanian Foreign Minister warned that de-risking was only a, quote, quick fix, and the EU should consider decoupling. A few days later, the EU's de facto foreign minister, Josep Borrell, published an essay titled My View on China and EU-China Relations, where he focused on what he described as imbalances between the EU and China, arguing that the EU needs to reduce its trade deficit with China, which he compared to the EU's pre-war trade deficit with Russia by negotiating better access to China's internal market. Borrell also argued that the EU should do more to protect its own internal market within WTO rules and pushed for a more hawkish stance on Taiwan. Tensions were strained further this week when China's ambassador to France suggested that post-Soviet countries, including not just Ukraine but also the Baltic states, don't have sovereignty under international law. This prompted a furious reaction from the Baltic states, not just at China, which has since walked back the comments, but also at those Western European leaders that have been buddying up to Beijing. Clearly, there's a division here between Western and Central Europe, but there's also a division within Western Europe on quite how close the EU should stick to China. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, for example, this week said he wanted to reactivate the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, which was first conceived in 2013 but rejected by the European Parliament in May 2021. This was a step too far even for Macron, who told Politico there was, quote, no chance of any progress and that it was just not practicable. Even within the German government, there are deep divisions on this point. While Schultz's SPD might favour closer relations with China, the Greens have publicly argued that this would make Germany dependent on China in the same way it was on Russia. So 
who's writing all this? What policies should the EU take on China? Well, because we're a neutral channel, we're not going to take a side on this. We're just going to give you the arguments for and against, and you can make your own mind up. Let's start with the three arguments for a closer relationship with China. First, the EU can't afford anything else. China is, by some measure, the EU's largest trading partner. European companies depend on Chinese imports, and they need a growing Chinese consumer market to export too. The European economy is already under serious strain, thanks to the disruption to Russian energy supplies and the Biden administration's Inflation Reduction Act, which actively discriminates against European companies. Essentially, the EU is more dependent on China and has less fiscal space than the US, so they simply can't afford a full-on decoupling. Second, Europe needs to cooperate with China if it wants to solve the most pressing problems of our time, like, most obviously, climate change. This was an argument made by both Borrell and von der Leyen. Decoupling from China ignores the fact that, in a globalised world, China is just too big to do without. Third, Europe can't rely on the US. While it's true that the US is currently the EU's main ally and Europe's security dependence on America has been laid bare by Ukraine, blindly following Washington is a risky strategy. America is becoming increasingly isolationist in its foreign policy, and a Republican victory in 2024 would only accelerate this trend. So those are the arguments for a closer relationship. What about the arguments for distancing from China? Well, the first and most popular argument is that, while decoupling might be expensive, the EU can't afford to be dependent on unfriendly countries, as demonstrated by the war in Ukraine and Putin's weaponization of energy supplies. Proponents of this argument also argue that decoupling represents an opportunity to reindustrialize. In other words, to bring high-value manufacturing jobs from China to the EU. Second, it's naive to think the EU can cooperate with China. The Biden administration, for example, has tried to compartmentalize cooperation with China on climate change. But Beijing has instead tried to leverage climate policy to force the US into playing down its human rights concerns. Third, the EU needs to support Taiwan. A war over Taiwan would be truly catastrophic for the entire world, and the EU needs to do all it can to deter Beijing by distancing itself and demonstrating its willingness to isolate China in the event of conflict. So, what do you think? Should the EU de-risk or decouple? Let us know in the comments down below. That's all for this video, but there's a whole world of TLDR content out there. You might not know, but we actually have five different TLDR channels explaining news from the UK, Europe, and the rest of the world, breaking down the latest developments in the business world, and also running through the day's most important news that you might have missed. TLDR has been doing this for around six years now, so to celebrate our anniversary, we'd love it if you subscribed. Not only to this channel, but also any of the others that interest you. They're all linked in the description. Our whole purpose is to make the world around you more understandable, to unpack the confusing parts of the news in a way that's interesting, factual, and entirely non-partisan. So if that's something you're into, then you have five channels to enjoy. Thanks for your support over the last six years. It really means a lot.